Hello and welcome to this episode of CNM Explores. My name is Mike Murphy and today we're going to be answering the question, is raw milk really bad for us? In this day and age, there are loads of questions about should we be consuming milk and dairy products? And as a nutritional therapist, I frequently find myself working with clients to try to get them to remove that food category from their diet because it is an inflammatory food group. But that's processed dairy. Coming up, we're going to be looking at raw dairy, what it is, how it's produced, and the differences between raw dairy and what you find on your supermarket shelves. We're going to look at the nutritional aspects of raw milk, and then we're going to also explore dairy intolerances and some of the problems that people experience when they overconsume dairy products and why. But first, let's start where milk begins. So here we are in the beautiful pastures of Plawhatch Farm in Sussex, England. What a wonderful example of a raw milk dairy farm. Of course, it all starts here in the pasture with the quality of the soil. The quality of the milk can be directly traced back to the quality of the soil, which after all nourishes all of the vegetation that feeds the cattle. Everything a cow needs is right here in the pasture. After all, grass is what cows evolved eating. And it's very much an ecosystem at play here. Right? The pasture, of course, nourishes the cows and their manures nourish the soil that the pastures and the grass grow in. It's estimated that your average cow deposits up to 60 kilograms of manure in the pastures every single day. That's a lot of nutrients being poured back into the soil. So this is where it's at. Pastures are far more than just grasses. We've got herbs in the mix, rich in vitamins and minerals and antioxidants, lots of different species to nourish the cows. To take an example here, clover. Cows love clover, very rich in protein. And the oils that we find in grasses are very high in omega-3 fats. Omega-3 fats are anti-inflammatory and of course those fats make their way into the animal and the milk. We know that grass-fed cows produce milk that has much higher omega-3 levels. Now when we look at cows that are fed on cereal grains, we find their milk is much higher in omega-6 fats. Omega-6 fats are pro-inflammatory, which means they cause inflammation in the body. Twice a day, the cows are milked. The head herdsman leads them from the pastures and then up the path. They're led to the yard and one by one, they make their way into the milking parlor to be milked. They seem ever so relaxed by the process. They know exactly what to do. So if you've ever heard the term to ruminate, when we ruminate, we chew on something over and over in our mind. Cows are what we call ruminants, which means they have the ability to unswallow their food so they can chew it again and again and again to help process it. They have these very large stomachs, like 50 gallon tanks that have multiple compartments. The biggest compartment is called the rumen, which they fill up with relatively unchewed grass. And then they find a quiet place to ruminate. So grass is really high in a fiber called cellulose, which humans can't digest, but cows can through this rumination process. And also with the help of trillions of mi microorganisms that reside in their rumen. The microorganisms job is to help digest the grass and help extract the nutrition from that grass. Interestingly enough, cows get a lot of their protein from the bacteria that lives on the grass that they consume and then multiplies in their gut. So it's a real beneficial relationship for the cows. The bacteria not only help extract the nutrition from the grass, but they're also a good source of protein for them.
So because raw milk is not pasteurized, the hygiene standards have to be absolutely paramount at every stage of the milking process. Pasteurization is a patented process that was invented in the late 1800s and named after the inventor Louis Pasteur. And it's basically where we heat milk to a high temperature for a period of time to kill bacteria that might otherwise make the milk go off prematurely, so theoretically it extends shelf life, and it also can kill pathogens and microbes that might be harmful to humans. So supporters of pasteurization say that it extends shelf life and protects human health. But you have to keep in mind that pasteurization of milk was only introduced in the 1920s to combat diseases and conditions like tuberculosis and infant diarrhea and other diseases that emerged as a result of poor animal nutrition and dirty production methods from the process of industrialized large-scale dairy farming, right? The unfortunate thing is when you pasteurize milk, you kill the digestive enzymes, you denature proteins, you diminish vitamins like vitamin B12 and B6, and you also end up killing off beneficial bacteria like lactobacillus, which is really important for the human gut. Lactobacillus also helps to digest lactose in the milk, and lactobacillus creates a pH environment that prevents organisms like E. coli and salmonella that might otherwise be harmful from overgrowing. Some of us may remember the slogan, Milk for Strong Bones, which was actually a post-war government-backed marketing campaign to increase sales of milk because of a surplus from oversubsidization. And boy, was that campaign effective because here we are almost 80 years later, and most people believe that without milk, they'll become calcium deficient. But nothing could be further from the truth. Milk is definitely high in calcium, but it's not a particularly good source of the other nutrients we need to build strong bones, like vitamin K and D and magnesium. Dark green vegetables like broccoli and kale, for example, are good sources of calcium, and they're also really good sources of those other bone-friendly nutrients. After all, where do cows get their calcium? They eat green grass. So what is lactose intolerance? Well, to put it simply, it's the inability to digest lactose. But what is lactose? Well, lactose is the primary sugar in milk products. And in order to digest lactose, we make an enzyme in our gut called lactase. Now, we make the most of this enzyme when we're first born because we're living on nothing but milk. But after we wean, our ability to make lactase starts to taper off. And if we don't make enough lactase, Lactose ends up being fermented by our gut bacteria, and that's when the problems start. Symptoms like bloating, wind, stomach pain, cramps, diarrhea are often experienced. Now, it's a pretty common condition. It's estimated that up to 70% of the adult population don't make enough lactase, but a small percentage of the population do, but it depends on where you're from. People of Southeast Asia, for example, 90% of them do not make lactase, and therefore lactose intolerance is a much bigger issue. Contrasting that with Scandinavia, the exact opposite. 90% of the adult population still make lactase, and we see lower levels of lactose intolerance. Some lactose intolerant individuals report that they can handle raw milk without the symptoms, and that might be because pasteurized dairy kills off those digestive enzymes and the beneficial bacteria that help to digest that lactose in the gut. And raw milk is never pasteurized. Now, many, many people have no issue with lactose, but they still have a problem with cow's milk. Cow's milk allergy is one of the most common allergies, especially among infants and young children. Symptoms can be relatively mild, like acne or nasal congestion to severe allergic reactions. 
Cow's milk is, after all, a food that humans didn't evolve consuming. We evolved over a couple of million years as hunter-gatherers, and in that time, it would be really hard to milk a wild animal. It just didn't happen. Dairy consumption didn't come into our food chain until agriculture, about 10,000 years ago. So it's really no wonder why in many people, their immune system reacts to dairy foods, which tend to have a pro-inflammatory response. But could it be that we're simply over-processing dairy? What about raw milk? There's not a lot of studies out there, but perhaps raw milk doesn't lead to that same pro-inflammatory response. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Once the milk has been collected, it's filtered and cooled, and then bottled up to be put on the shelf for nine o'clock the next morning. Raw milk production really is a simple process, and the final product is just how nature intended. It really is grass to milk, just to add cows. So, is raw milk really bad for us? If you haven't already, please like this video and subscribe to our channel, and turn on the bell icons if you want to be notified as soon as we upload the next video. So to summarize, raw milk is a living food, rich in enzymes that help us digest the milk properly. There are so many health benefits in raw milk, we can't cover them all in one episode, but suffice to say, pasteurized milk does not convey many of these health benefits because the raw proteins and enzymes are destroyed by heat and over-processing. Now, all supermarket milk is pasteurized, so if you want to find raw milk, you won't find it on the supermarket shelves. But there are independent, organic raw milk farms all over the UK and the world. So give raw milk a try as part of a healthy, balanced diet, and we'll see you on the next CNM Explorers.